Welcome to the Jax Rudolph Podcast. I am your host, Jackson Rudolph, and this is episode 103. I'm flying solo tonight because we've got a film study episode. It's been a hot minute since we've done a film study, but we're coming up on a major tournament. The Battle of Atlanta is next week, and as we typically do before big tournaments, I like to take a little trip through history and go back and look at some clips uh, from that event over the years. Now, I'm pretty sure that last year we did an episode that was a Battle of Atlanta film study, but I typically, when I do film studies, I try to put together a little bit more of a narrative and have everything kind of be connected. For this one, I wanted it to be spontaneous, so I just kind of randomly picked some videos uh, from some really well-known competitors, some lesser-known competitors. Uh, There's even a video of me in there that we're going to hit at the end that I want to talk a bit about because I think there's a lot that can be learned from it. Uh, Spoiler alert, it's a video that I drop in, which was not many of on YouTube because most of the time, if a competitor drops, people delete it. But this one made it onto YouTube, and I'm glad that it did because I think it's a great teaching moment that I want to share with you guys here tonight. But first, we'll take care of some of our housekeeping. So you see the Sport Karate News scrolling across the bottom of the stream. The first thing is that the Team Paul Mitchell Experience Camp is back this year at the U.S. Open on Thursday before the events that evening. So a lot of people may not know this, but U.S. Open is holding events on Thursday evening. The team divisions, as well as traditional challenge, is going down on Thursday evening, and then there's other competition all day Friday. But earlier in the day Thursday, there's a very rare opportunity to train with almost all of the members of Team Paul Mitchell. And I'm going to just be honest with you guys, it's a bargain. Uh, There's two sessions. They're an hour and a half each. For one session, you can train with almost all of Team Paul Mitchell for 79 bucks. And then if you want to do three hours of training, that's 129 bucks. That's only $30 more expensive than an average private lesson with one world champion. And you're getting to work with like 11 of them at the same time. Not to mention the fact that the fighting coach, Damon Gilbert, is actually going to step in and help teach some of the fighting as well. So not only are you getting almost all of the athletes, you're getting an all-time great fighter himself and the coach of the Team Paul Mitchell fighting squad, Damon Gilbert. He's going to be teaching in the seminar as well. So Team Paul Mitchell Experience Camp, that's going to be awesome. You guys can't pass that up. Uh, If you want to check it out, head on over to the Team Paul Mitchell Karate Facebook page after you get done watching this episode, of course, and then you can check out all the information there. The link to register through madaction.com has been posted. So I highly, highly, highly recommend you guys go check that out if you're going to be at the U.S. Open this year. In other sport karate news, Shaheen Jahanvash, somebody that I competed against many times, son of promoter Muhammad Jahanvash, and a multiple-time grand champion himself. He is celebrating a birthday today. So happy birthday, Shaheen. Hope you've had an awesome day, my man, if you're tuning in. And finally, the last bit of Sport Karate news this week is some Jackson Rudolph podcast news. And it is at the Battle of Atlanta. We have got three live episodes of this podcast coming. So I want to give everybody that is a fan of the show a little bit of an update of what's going to be going down over the next few weeks. So obviously, we're here this week for the Battle of Atlanta preview show and the film study. Next week, there will not be a normal podcast episode because we have these three live streams and all of them are formatted to be like actual TV shows that you would see. So the first is going to be following the Friday Night Fights, which is a special extra nighttime show that the Battle of Atlanta does on Friday night. That's going to be streamed right here on Black Belt Magazine. After the streaming of that event, There's going to be a follow-up show called Late Night with Jackson, which is an episode of the Jackson Rudolph podcast, but it's structured like The Tonight Show or The Late Show with Jimmy Fallon or something like that, where we're actually going to have coaches, athletes, they're going to come on the show as guests. There is a set match at that event at Friday Night Fights between Team Legend and Team Dojo Elite. The winning team of that set match has been invited to come on the show. We're going to interview that winning team and talk about the action that just happened earlier that evening. And again, this is a professional set, professional production crew. This is not your typical podcast with Jackson and his ring light, uh, you know, sitting in his apartment bringing you guys a sport karate show. This is going to be another level. And I give a huge thank you and shout out to the Battle of Atlanta for making that possible. So that's what the first show is. That's what Late Night with Jackson is. And by the way, if you check out my personal social media accounts, you can see the breakdown uh, of when all of these are going to be airing and those kind of details. 
The second show is going to be on Saturday morning before competition starts at 7.30 a.m. is when the, the stream is going to start. And that's called Good Morning Sport Karate, a play on Good Morning America. And then we're going to have other athletes coming in for interviews. And that will be kind of a, a preparation for the events of that day, getting everybody ready to watch the events that are, that are going to go down at the Battle of Atlanta. And again, there will be live streams from Black Belt Magazine, among other entities. I'm sure Point Fighter Live and SportMartialArts.com, they'll be doing live streams and things of that nature as well, and definitely support those streams too. And speaking of those other media entities, that brings me to the third and final show next week, which is the Battle Zone Countdown. This is Sport Karate's version of Sunday NFL Countdown. We're leading up to the nighttime finals. I'm going to be joined by three other Sport Karate media personalities. We've got Mallory Woods from SportMartialArts.com, Jeff Doss from the Inside Scoop on Martial Arts Inner Network, and we've got Alex Reyes from Point Fighter Live. All four of us are going to be on a panel, and we're going to be talking just like you'd see regular sports analysts. We're going to be talking about that evening, making predictions, talking about matchups that we're excited for. It's going to be a lot of fun, and I hope that you guys tune into that. And if you are going to be at the Battle of Atlanta, I do believe there is going to be a limited amount of in-person seating for these streams. So if you think this is a really cool opportunity and you want to be in the live studio audience, I do think that will be possible for a limited number of people to be in the crowd. Of course, as long as you stay quiet and cheer when we tell you to, right? Just like with any TV show. Uh, but it's going to be so much fun. I'm so excited about it. I cannot express enough gratitude to Black Belt Magazine for being the streaming platform, making it possible, as well as a huge thank you to the Battle of Atlanta and Truth Entertainment for making the production happen, for inviting me to come and do this with the podcast. We're going to have so much fun. And I really haven't had an opportunity to talk about that level of detail about it. We already have a few other guests confirmed. But I'll, I'll kind of let those things leak out as they need to. Uh, but that is the big housekeeping for what's going to be going on over the next two weeks. The following week is exciting sport karate news for Jackson Rudolph and Gabrielle Dunn because the following week is our wedding. I'm super excited for that. There is not going to be a podcast episode the week of the wedding. Sorry about that, guys. You, you guys will have to miss me that week. And then the following week is U.S. Open. So because we're going to be at U.S. Open, there will not be a podcast that week either. So the three episodes at Battle of Atlanta are going to cover those next three weeks, right? Because I've got the wedding, and then we've got U.S. Open. And then, of course, right after U.S. Open, we're going to have the U.S. Open review show, maybe get some of the winners joining the podcast, and that'll be a big show. In the meantime, I will also continue writing my articles for Black Belt Magazine. So you'll see the Jacksons 5 come out for the Battle of Atlanta after the event as well as any special news that happens, uh, updates about the event, maybe even a preview. We'll see how some of those cards get played. Uh, but that is kind of the housekeeping answer sport karate news. Don't miss next week, Friday, Saturday, three live shows of the Jacks Rudolph podcast. It's going to be a ton of fun. And now without further ado, it's time to dive in to some film study. So give me one moment as I switch over here. I see some people tuning in. Jeannie Jones, Michael Mobs. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Really appreciate the support. And hey, for a film study episode, drop those comments. Let me know what questions you guys have. At the end of the show, I'll be addressing some of those as we wrap up some of the videos. I think our playlist tonight is only about 23 videos long. Uh, so the show should run relatively quickly. So I will have time for you guys' questions at the end if you have any. So I'm going to go ahead and get it set up here. And we're going to hit the share button. We're going to share screen. And let's see, we want to go to YouTube right here, share. All right, there's that. And now let me make sure everything's looking good on this end, play with some settings here. Definitely don't want that one. There we go. Now let's get this banner out of you guys' way so you can see what's going on in the videos here. All right, do I like that one or do I like this one? Definitely not that one. Let's go here. This, this lets you guys see more of the action. So I'll just be this little talking head down here in the corner. All right. So first video that we have on the playlist here tonight, you know, for Battle of Atlanta, we got to start it with one of the legends. We've got the one and only Carmichael Simon. He did the first ever 720 in competition at the Battle of Atlanta in 1994. This is the 1995 Battle of Atlanta. So one year after that epic performance, Shout out to this Paul Mitchell gi. I love, love, love the Paul Mitchell logo on the lapel. We might need to bring that back sometimes. That's super vintage. I love, love, love the look of it. 
And also, I love the, the drama and suspense that Carmichael always brought to his routines. I love this intro. I love the lighting change, too. I can't imagine, especially for weapons competitors today doing releases and things like that, that they would like the lighting changing so much over the course of a performance. But it's pretty dope to see it as this little throwback footage. There's the trademark patented 720 from Carmichael. Beautiful 540. The extension of the hand techniques is crazy. We get another lighting change. Huge split kick. You got to love it. No argument. One of the best trickers, if not the best tricker of his time. The things that Carmichael do, could do, his creativity, his ingenuity was absolutely incredible. And, you know, a lot of times in sports we talk about, could you tell the story of a sport without so-and-so? You could not tell the story of sport karate without mentioning Carmichael Simon. He's just that guy. He was so influential to the development of the sport, choreography, tricking, extreme forms in general. Um, that's a master at work. And what I wanted to show next is not a Disney Plus advertisement. Uh, so we're going to skip over this one real quick. Disney is not a sponsor of the Jax Rudolph podcast. But Disney, if you're watching, you want to sponsor the show, hit me up. Let me know. So this is also from 1995, Battle of Atlanta. And this is Butch Marks, obviously a member of one of the great all-time sport karate families. That includes his sister, Casey Marks Nash, Trevor Nash, Chelsea Nash. That family is insane. Between them and the Plowdens, I got no idea who the greatest sport karate family of all time is. Those are some crazy sport karate families. But the reason that I bring up this video of Butch Marks is because I think it shows great. There's a 720. This is 1995, and Butch is a junior. This is one year after Carmichael did the first ever 720 in competition, and Butch is throwing a 720 in the youth division. So that shows you how in the 90s, particularly the mid to late 90s, how quickly sport karate was evolving and changing. The fact that the lights went out as he was doing that backflip is kind of crazy. But the, the speed at which this sport evolved in the mid to late 90s is insane. When you have an adult competitor doing something that's never been seen before in 94, and then a youth competitor landing the same move at the same tournament in the finals one year later, that's insane. That is insane growth and development. We see the split kick. And then this was a classic vintage ending was to end in the split position. The good leg strength there, getting up out of it that way. That was unique. And then obviously Butch would go on to uh, join his sister and represent Team Paul Mitchell later on in his career. Uh, so that, that was a good – I'd never seen that video of Butch before. I'd never seen a video of Butch that young. All the videos I had seen were uh, after he was an adult competitor. And as we see the, uh, the little logo here from Tournament News Online, huge shout out to uh, all of these media entities that keep this content on YouTube for us to review it here on the show. So anytime you guys see those logos, definitely after the show's over, go and check that out. And so now we're moving on to a, a lesser known competitor, uh, but certainly a very good competitor. I always enjoyed watching him when he competed. This is Tyler Powell of Team 100%. A lot of people called him T-Pow back in the day. Um, and he, he was... On stage occasionally, but he was never like your consummate guy on stage. But there's so many things about this routine that are impressive. Obviously, a huge X out here at the beginning. I loved his hand combinations. He had a lot of creativity with his hands. Like even here in the intro, doing a lot of the intro on his knees, that's unique. Um, and again, I respect competitors that are very creative. You see the extension of the chop punch combinations there, mixed in an elbow. See the beautiful cheat nine, beautiful raise right into the uh, flash kick there. And then as he goes through, again, some more creativity. I love that little uh, low, double low sidekick there going into the axe kick. And then like this, like the little touch. And then I, he kind of like did like a double leg there. Whenever a competitor does a move that I don't even know what the name of it would be, that impresses me, right? So I'm going to pause this and rewind it. And I want to see that move again in slow motion because it, it caught me off guard. Like you don't see stuff like that every day. We're back kind of at the beginning of the performance here. I'll rewind a little bit. Let's go, yeah, right here. Let's go ahead and switch it to the quarter speed at this point. So take a look at what Tyler Powell does on this trick coming up here in just a second, right? So there's the little double low side kicks to the axe kick that I was talking about. Throws the elbow. Again, you don't see elbows often thrown in open competition, so that's cool to see. There's the set and then the elbow, little two-handed technique here. Full extension on all of these. You rarely see that in these competitors going at full speed. Another elbow strike. And then check this out. Touches the ground. There's like, brings the legs together almost like a D leg and then goes into the split. If there's any trickers in the comments that are more knowledgeable about tricking than me, please let me know what you would call that move. I had never seen that before. So when I was going through videos and trying to find some good options for this film study, I saw him do that and he made the cut instantly. That was really cool. Uh, now we'll go ahead and let him finish up the form here. 
while he's finishing that routine, I'll go ahead and switch tabs real quick, see if we got any comments coming in. All right. Oh, man, man. It looks. Oh, so we got a Sailor Moon D leg split. Thank you, Joe Troya, for bringing us some knowledge as far as the terminology goes there. So, yeah, I see that with the, the ground touch and the way you set it up. So, Sailor Moon D leg split. Again, so unique, so innovative. I love to see that. And then, uh, of course, we might have some naysayers in the comments about what they think about sport karate. But hey, we love sport karate. And so those comments can get out of here. Just deleted that comment. But we all love sport karate here on this show. So we're going to talk love the sport karate, all these amazing athletes. And speaking of amazing athletes, as Matt Emig takes the stage, this is in that same division against Tyler Powell, which kind of tells you why Tyler Powell may have been a lesser known competitor. He was competing against guys like Matt Emig, right? I've said on the show many times before, Matt Emig is, in my opinion, the greatest all-around CMX competitor of all time. Creating musical extreme, his ability uh, in the forms and in the weapons division. He's the greatest nunchucks competitor of all time by a significant margin. Um, he's one of my favorite CMX Forms competitors of all time. Obviously, there's a little bit more debate about who the singular best CMX Forms competitor is ever. But if you look at CMX altogether, in my opinion, Matt Emig's the GOAT. Huge double illusion there. Absolutely beautiful. The knee spin into the race, swinging right into the court. I mean, it, it's just beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Big scissor kick to the round there. Love that. Does the little rodeo into the cheat seven, lands in the split. And then one thing that I loved about Matt, is that a lot of people think that the last move of their form has to be something crazy. Matt would just do a tornado kick. And this is something that I never truly understood about Matt. I was like, why would you just tornado kick here, right? So you see the huge cheat seven, grabbing the heels in the middle of it. I don't know if you technically call that a rodeo, but I did. And then here we go, just a tornado kick. That's it. <laughs> but it, it didn't matter. It's like, you know, Matt could just do a tornado kick at the end of his form and still win, despite the fact that that's not anything crazy because of how good everything else was. Like, again, there's not enough you can say about Matt Emig. Uh, his greatness is, is unmatched, in my opinion. Uh, however, at the time, he did have a formidable challenger in that 2012 season as Micah Carnes moved up into the adult division. Now, if you go back and you look at the stats over the course of that year, uh, Matt was still dominant. Matt was still Matt Emig. Uh, but Micah had one of the most dominant careers that we've ever seen in the 14 to 17 division. And don't get me wrong, Micah had some big wins once he moved up into the adult division as well. And Micah himself is an all-time great CMX Forms competitor. Uh, I think he'd be on almost anybody's top 10 of CMX Forms competitors all time. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of people who would make an argument that he's in the top five. And there's some members of Team AKA that probably have him at number one. Uh, and, you know, uh, that, that there's arguments for that. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he was that good. He was that clean. And so you see there a signature on the elbows into the huge Jesus at the beginning. You love that. And that's one of the things that was always so impressive about Micah was just how effortless his movements look. So you're going to hear me give a lot of high praise to Micah here because to be as dominant as he was for as long as he was, uh, you got to be this good. Beautiful extension, pointing the toes, G-switch into the corkscrew, hands behind the back. That's crazy. Cheat seven to the split there. The level of difficulty to kind of come over almost into that push-up position and then do the Webster there, absolutely insane. Is that like a Gumby touchdown raise thing off of his elbows? Like I, Again, like when I'm seeing moves that I don't even really know for sure what to call them, that's how you know I'm entertained. I'm going to rewind here to the Webster because of how crazy this Webster variation is. Check this out. I mean, this is wild. So here's the cheat seven. Good extension on the kick. Lands in the split. Look at this. Brings the leg through into basically a push-up position. Hands leave the ground to be able to have the core strength to pull yourself over like that and land that. We're going to check that out one more time. I mean, that is insane. Here's the split. Left leg comes back through. Hands leave the ground right there. Webster. I mean, that's crazy. We Nobody else has ever done anything like that in a form. I'm getting so excited. I needed to drink water. And then look at the punches there. I like the fact that we're still in slow motion. Full extension, beautiful technique, great execution. And then I'll go ahead and speed it back up so we can get to the end here. But again, can't say enough about how great Micah Carnes was. Uh, anybody that was lucky enough to watch him compete was a fan. Uh, I mean, he, he was just incredible. His, his ability level, his work ethic, his talent, uh, you, you, you can't. You can't say anything else about it. So Micah Carnes, and that was three guys in a division from just musical forms at Battle of Atlanta 2012, uh, which shows you how deep the division was at that time. 
Now we talked about Micah, we talked about Matt. I want to go to another great adult competitor that was more so part of Matt's generation. Uh, he did compete against Micah a few times, and that is Mark Cannonizzato. And I wanted to bring up some of these videos from the old PKA ring because it's just so unique to see forms and weapons competitors competing in a ring that has the, the ropes around it. It's just that there's no other time, to my knowledge, that it happened and looked like this other than at the Battle of Atlanta. I'm sure there were maybe some other ones way back in the day that had forms and weapons competitors competing like this. But in the modern era, post-2000, uh, I mean, this you just wouldn't see this. Uh, so it's really cool, really unique. And then I'm also a sucker for the old uh, purple straight up uniforms. Love the look of that. I wanted to wear one real bad when I was a kid. And then, uh, you know, I fell in love with Paul Mitchell. But got all kinds of love for straight up and Mr. G. He's always had a great squad. And Mark Cannonizzato, um, potentially the greatest forms and weapons competitor that team straight up ever had. Uh, I'd have to go through and really do some thinking about some of the other guys they've had over the years. But Mark Cannonizzato may well be the, the straight up forms and weapons uh, greatest of all time there. And you can see why. I mean, look at this. The hang time he gets there. Huge flash kick coming out of the tuck. Beach twist round was beautiful. You might as well trademark the beach twist round uh, for Mark Cannonizzato. Beautiful side kick right into the double knife hand. Great traditional martial arts skill. And then also note the length of this form. This is a good solid length form. We see a lot of forms nowadays that are a bit on the short side. The form that Mark just ran, I feel like, is exactly the length that a good form should be. So as we're transitioning videos here, I'm going to go ahead and click back over and see what we got going on in the comments. Oh, we got somebody giving us a top five. We got a top five coming in from Michael Brume as we switch over to a video of Ryan Wells here. Michael Brume says his top five, I assume this is for CMX Forms competitors. He's got Tyler Weaver, Michael Carnes, Jacob Pinto, Matt Emick, Aiden Kennedy. That's pretty solid, Mike, but you're leaving out guys like Mike Chat, John Valera, Carmichael. You're leaving out some of the OGs who set the ground for all of these guys to come up, excuse the voice crack there, that was crazy. Tells you why I need some water. Anyway, we're going to focus on Ryan Wells here. Now, Ryan Wells is a name that more people that are fans of sport karate should know because this guy was one of the most dominant competitors ever for about a two or three year stretch, represented Team Straight Up as well as Team Paul Mitchell during that time. And he was the man in traditional weapons in the 1300 division when I was just coming on the circuit uh, and wasn't very good. So Ryan Wells was the standard that I had to train up to in those traditional divisions uh, to try to become a good competitor. Um, and ultimately, I was able to, to get a win on him in forms at Diamond Nationals 2008 in a runoff where I made stage for the first time. Uh, but it was a grind to get to that level. Uh, and the thing that made Ryan special is that not only is his technique good, as you can see, he was an innovator in traditional. These low turns that he would do, this was a drill that he would work on with Coach Joe Greenhall and his dad, Tim Wells. Uh, this is a drill that he would do. And one day they said, hey, let's put this in his form. Let's put it in the form and see if people like it. And it brought a level of difficulty to traditional forms and weapons that other people weren't able to match. And so Ryan had that special skill and he used it to have a very dominant run for several years on the circuit, uh, ultimately moved on and pursued other things before ever going up to the adult division. Uh, but I got a ton of respect for Ryan Wells because I spent a couple of years getting my rear end handed to me by Ryan Wells in that low horse stance. Uh, and so we're moving on to another one of these uh, events that was here in the ring at Battle of Atlanta. Uh, and this one, so Ronnie Smith, who is the, the smaller competitor here with his instructor, Dre Graham of Team Full Circle, Ronnie was one of like my first friends in NASCAR competition. Uh, and I haven't seen Ronnie in years. So if there's any chance that Ronnie sees this, I hope you're doing well, my man. Um, but Ronnie was like one of my first friends that I competed against. Um, and it was cool to see him getting up and making it to the stage in the team sync division. I want to say this is probably like 2007 or eight. Uh, I think it's 2008, actually. I hope I'm not wrong about that. Uh, but anyway, so this is like very early on in my career. Um, and Dre Graham, this is super unique, right? This idea to run Goju Shio with Ronnie on his shoulders. This one that was originally done by, I believe it was Ryan Redfoot and Caitlin Mosley who were the first to do this with kind of the tiered traditional competitors. Uh, but seeing them do it was really cool and doing it very well. And Dre Graham now, very, very accomplished teacher. I still follow him on social media. Uh, in the state of Florida, he's gotten all kinds of, of awards and recognitions from the state for outstanding teaching, doing great things for the community there. Uh, so Dre, congratulations to you, my man. The stuff that you're doing with your profession is awesome. 
got a ton of respect for it. And uh, this also gives us a little taste of what old school traditional forms was on NASCA, uh, where you had traditional forms, not so much the way that the WKF intended it to look, but more so catered for NASCA competition and meant to be a show, meant to be entertaining. Low stances, lots of big key eyes. Anybody that's a fan of the show knows how much I love this style of traditional forms. And don't get me wrong, I love the new WKF stuff that we see on NASCA as well. Um, but I do think there's still a place in the sport for this kind of form because I always love watching it. I'm, I'm a sucker for this stuff. It's the type of traditional form that I did. Uh, but of course, I mean, my fiance does the WKF stuff, so I love that too. As we get another unwelcome advertisement, I don't even know what this advertisement's for. Something about the electricity. We're going to move on. And now I think this is our last video from the ring like this. And I can't do a Battle of Atlanta film study without featuring one of the greatest sport karate competitors in the history of Georgia, in the history of sword, in the history of weapons competition. You got Kalman Choka. And this is Kalman Choka pre-Paul Mitchell. So I'm almost certain now this is 2008 because I believe that Kalman debuted. Yeah, he debuted double sword at the end of 2007 did it throughout the 2008 season, and then got added to Paul Mitchell shortly after that. So this is team elite, uh, Kalman Choka, before he was on Paul Mitchell. And uh, getting to see him do this double sword form, especially in his early days where he was still trying to prove that this was something that could work and could be dominant, uh, just so special, right? I mean, if he's not in your top five greatest weapons competitors of all time, there's a problem with your list because he absolutely should be. In my opinion, he's the greatest sword competitor of all time. And what he was able to do innovating the double sword um, is something that we really haven't seen at the level that Kalman did it uh, as far as innovation goes. And so we watched the master at work here. I loved that intro move, a move that's relatively low risk, but just so subtle and, and cool to kind of have one sword across the arm, pass over the head, probably inspired by a bow move calling around the world, which I think is interesting. The double box cutters, I love that. To me, that was one of the most difficult releases he ever did was in that 2008 season when he did those double horizontally rotating releases. The level of difficulty on that is just absolutely out of this world. And then signature of his, rolling one sword off the other into the release. And the other thing about Kalman and what set him apart from other people over the years that have tried double sword, the extension and cleanliness of every single one of his cuts it's not just the tricks. He wasn't just going out there and throwing swords around. His ability to sell this form and his ability to execute good, clean martial arts technique is what allowed him to be as dominant as he was. And then, of course, you see the signature ending from Kalman. You got to love it. There's a great picture of Kalman in that pose that he did at the end of this form. Uh, I've seen it on a couple of tournament flyers over the years. Uh, again, just love watching Kalman Choka. And as fans of the show know, anytime that I show Kalman Choka, I always try to go and find another video of Kalman Choka rocking the single sword because everybody thinks about how great of a double sword competitor he was. They forget that the man was a fantastic single sword practitioner uh, because you never got to see it on stage. On stage, he would always do the double sword. But what was especially impressive about his run, and, and one thing that I think made it so effective, was that he did single sword in the eliminations. The judges weren't getting four, five, six doses of the double sword form every single tournament. He didn't need the double sword to win in the division. He was saving that form for once or twice per tournament. If he needed it in the runoff, he would do it in the runoff. But most of the time, he was preserving it for the stage. And so it was rare at an event that you got to see it because it would only happen once or twice, unlike a lot of competitors who run the same form throughout the divisions, into the runoffs, into the overall grands. And so you see a lot of the same thing. One thing that allowed Kalman to be so dominant was the fact that the double sword form was a treat. He could win with the single sword form in the eliminations. As you see here, horizontal release into the Lazy Susan, signature move of his again. And anytime that somebody's a true innovator, you're going to hear me say signature move a lot. Kalman had them all throughout his forms. Almost everything he did was originally innovated by him. That little Leviosa is what we call it with a bow, kind of going around the back and off the back of the hand to push the sword in the air. Love that. And then even with the single sword, you see the extension, the cleanliness of the cuts, absolutely beautiful, hitting full stances, selling every technique on home turf. You love to see it. And that is Kalman Choka. And then ending the form with the same intensity and presence as if he was doing a double sword form on stage. He didn't, he didn't compete to the moment. 
He competed the same way every single time. And now we're going to keep everything within the Kalman Choka family tree as we transition to one of my all-time favorite competitors, and that is Austin Crane. Now, Austin Crane does have a stumble in this form. I don't care. Some of the stuff that Austin does in this form is absolutely insane, and that's why I wanted to share it. I believe this is 2011 runoffs. This is the same uh, event that we just saw Kalman at, as you can tell by the background. Look at this. That is insane. Webster landed on one foot, pivot the other direction. As you're switching your commas from one hand to two hands, we're going to play that one back in slow motion because you guys got to get a closer look at this. This was an Austin Crane signature move. You absolutely love to see it. Check this out. So he's setting it up. Of course, we're going to watch him set it up in 0.25 speed. Here we go. Webster lands on the one foot, still on one foot, switches the commas to both hands, pivots, does another Webster, lands it. You can see the reactions in the background. That is insane. Ahead of his time. Crazy level of difficulty. Didn't mean to turn on the volume there. I mean to turn it back to normal speed so we can really enjoy this at full speed. And then much like Kalman, I was talking about the mix of the releases and the difficulty and the ability to execute good basics. Austin Crane was no different. You look at the cuts here. Nice seven cuts. Good power. And that's one thing I love to see in a comic competitor. When you can cut with power instead of just it being more finesse, but when your cuts, they actually have a, a force behind them. It makes the commas look a lot better. It's something that Rudy Raynon was a master of. And we see going into the jump front kick there, beautifully done. And then look at the difficulty. Now there he has the little stumble, but then look at the difficulty of the finger manipulation. Again, sometimes comma competitors don't get enough respect for the difficulty of some of their manipulations because it happens so fast. So that's why I want to slow this one down. Take a look at this, okay? So he's going to have the, the little bobble, I think, right there as he tries to catch it inverted. Winds up making a great save on it. And then watch this. So there's the finger roll. Gets it into reverse grip. Look at this. Finger roll into the release down low, switches his feet, makes the catch on the move directly into the cut. That level of difficulty is crazy. So subtle. little double finger roll to get back into the forward grip there, right into the front sweep. And then we're going to go ahead and go back to the normal playback speed here. And then setting up his trick pass to the back here. I believe he does a statue with the commas passing between the legs. Yep, beautifully executed. Statue was a signature move of his. And then going into more crazy finger manipulations. That little illusion manipulation was a signature move of his. Uh, so again, Austin Crane, absolutely love watching him. And like I said, we're keeping it in the Choka family tree a little bit. And now we're going to have a look at Audrey Donahue, uh, a, another person who's in my top five all time in terms of sword competitors. I said Calvin's at my number one. We see Caitlin DeShell in the background of this video. She's in my top five sword competitors of all time. And then Audrey's got to be on there as well. Um, Audrey, this is when she was representing Team All-Stars. And yes, the All-Stars, the Raymond Daniels, Jack Felton All-Stars, the Elijah Everill All-Stars, the Kevin Walker All-Stars that everybody knows about, right? Um, they had a forms and weapons team. Audrey Donahue was on it, Amanda Chen, Jacob Pinto, Dallas Lou. They had a really good forms and weapons team. When Raymond was on the show for episode 100, we talked about it. We talked about how Jackson Rudolph was almost on that team. Uh, but then, of course, I wound up with uh, with Paul Mitchell. Um, but anyway, so really cool kind of moment in sport karate history here for when that team was around, especially on the forms and weapons side. Obviously, they're still around on the fighting side. And then, again, with Audrey, we're going to see a lot of what we saw in Kalman. We're gonna, and obviously, she was a disciple of his, right? So, of course, you will. But the cleanliness of the cuts mixed in with the difficulty of the releases – Absolutely crazy. And the speed of the releases. Look at how fast she just rolled that off the back of the hand right into the release. Little manipulation there. Trapping the sword on the spine of the sword, so not exposing her skin to the blade. It's an aluminum blade, so she wouldn't have cut herself anyway. But trapping on the spine of the sword and then going into the release. Really good way to kind of get on the edge of something the judges might not like to see by touching the blade. But using the spine of the sword, using that creativity, still being able to pull off a difficult release. A lot of things to love about Audrey Donahue and uh, Apartments.com. You guys know that Apartments.com is a sponsor of the Jack Sweetall podcast? They're not. I'm kidding. Now we're going to move on to another Georgia legend. We got Marcel Jones. And really, when I do a random film study like this and I'm just picking people, it's going to wind up being a lot of people who are some of my personal favorites, right? So Marcel Jones, a personal favorite of mine, representing Team Pro Rank huge 540 to the knee. I mean, that is absolutely massive. Huge illusion twist. The way he landed that, so clean. 
Big stall pop front kick. I love the look of a stall pop front kick. If you're going to Battle of Atlanta, you're competing in a forms division, you do a stall pop front kick, I'm going to give you some props. I don't know why. I've just always loved that technique. Axe kick, big jump outside crescent kick into the split. Look at that stance. Look at the depth of that stance. That's beautiful. Full extension, power, intensity. Marcel Jones had everything. A little bit of crazy eyes there at the end as he finishes. That's good stage presence. You love to see it. And that is awesome stuff from the one and only Marcel Jones. I learned recently that apparently one of Marcel's nicknames back in the day was Mr. Clean, which is now the nickname of Team Paul Mitchell member Dawson Holt. Uh, so pretty cool to see that. We're actually not going to see Mark's full form here. That was just kind of cut off at the end of the video. And then I mentioned Kaylin Michelle in the background of the video earlier. Here is probably the statistically greatest forms and weapons competitor of all time. If you look at her resume and you look at her win percentage and the number of world championships, the number of overall grands that she was able to accumulate over the years from the time that she was a junior all the way through a pretty lengthy career in the adult division before going to Hollywood and becoming, you know, Gal Gadot's stunt double for Wonder Woman. Um, I mean, Caitlin's career, I, I don't know if there's another one that's like it numbers wise. I mean, there's not, there's not much more you can say. Beach twist there, right into the uh, side swipe, landed on both feet. And then again, I mean, the, the thing that made Caitlin special, what set her apart is she never made mistakes. I can think of maybe one time in her entire career that I saw her make a mistake and, and have a fall in a form in the finals. That was at Ocean States and Weapons one year. Other than that one time, I I'd never seen it. I'd never seen her make a mistake. She was always so flawless. And when you're flawless that consistently, you're going to rack up a lot of wins. And, and that's why Caitlin Michelle is, is one of the all-time greats. And then now I apparently just decided to throw it all the way back to 1996 again and show you some John Valera action. And then a, a great way to kind of parse apart the, the parts of John Valera's career is to pay attention to his haircut over the years. I love the long look, but then, of course, he had the short, more clean-cut look around 98 and 99 for the retirement. He did the bleached hair, right? Uh, so I guess that's, you know, par for the course with a Paul Mitchell member having to have great hair all the time, right? Uh, but anyway, so this is 1996, John Valera. While he's doing his intro here, I'm going to take another peek at the comments, see what everybody's saying. Absolutely seeing some more love in the comments. I love you guys giving your feedback on these forms. We see a huge uh, 720 there from John Valera. Any thoughts or questions you guys have, drop those down in the comments. I love to see it. Again, we are going to answer some questions at the end if I see any questions in the comments. And then like that technique right here. So like I said, kind of a theme of the show today is the fact that if you did something that I've never seen before, I'm going to give it props. I'm not sure what he just did. Let's rewind this a little bit. We're going to go back to 0.25 speed. Check this out. So he runs up into it. I know what this is. This is his classic, what, quadruple kick here? Yeah, he did that all the time. He was excellent at it. And then check this out on the following combo. He throws, there's the 540, landing down to the knee. It looks like I rewound a little bit too much, but that's okay. So he lands the 540 to the knee. High block punch. Little knife hand block. Here we go. So there's the spin hook. And then look at this. He goes down. It's like he's starting to do an illusion twist, and then he kind of like switches feet at the end and throws a little round kick in there. Again, so unique. Whenever you do something that stands out, not only is that going to catch my attention to get on the podcast, because in 1996, John Valera was not thinking about getting on my podcast one day, um, but it's going to help you stand out to the judges. That's the type of thing that when a judge sees something that they've never seen before, chances are they're going to give you some extra credit for that. It's not always about the level of difficulty of the techniques that you do. Because that right there, it didn't look like it'd be any harder than like a beach twist. So it wasn't an incredibly difficult technique, but it was just different, right? And who knows, maybe that was even a little slip up that JV had, and he was just covering it up by throwing that round kick in there. And if that's the case, sometimes that's how new moves are created. And also, consistency is about the ability to adapt. Now we're going to Josh Durbin, Josh Durbin, who on this podcast, Michael Guthrie called him the greatest informed tricker of all time. That's high praise coming from the greatest tricker of all time. And the stuff that Josh Durbin could do was crazy. You saw the stall backflip there was huge. He's doing that on carpet, which is really just a very thin layer of carpet over concrete, as many uh, events had back in that time around 2007, 2008. And then you see being able to land like the cork swing gainer, he's ahead of his time and he's ahead of his time on a very hard surface, high level of difficulty, big side swipe there. That was beautiful. Sets up for his corner pass. Huge like full X out step. It was almost like an Arabian, 
Uh, so I think that maybe like an Arabian with like an exaggerated X out coming out the end of it. Again, I guess that was the theme of the show. I guess I just kept clicking through YouTube videos until I saw things that I didn't really know what they were. And that's what I threw in the podcast tonight. Uh, but hopefully it's entertaining for you guys. And speaking of great informed trickers, Anish Sherpa, another great informed tricker. So, so many trickers look up to this guy. His style it was so unique and so different to be as long and as tall as he was and to execute the tricks that he did. Um, truly incredible. I'm not just talking about his sport karate competition. I'm talking about the samplers over the years, stuff like that. And he could throw some hands. Those were clean, fully extended hands. Beautiful hook kick. Now let's break this down because that is a massive, massive double cork that he just did. And he was almost perfectly upside down. This is 2006. This is 2006, people. You didn't see that in 2006. And also, I'm going to give a niche Sherpa props here, okay? You see the Pro Rank logo on his back. Hopefully, you guys can see my cursor when I screen share. Look at this. Extension of the punch. Extension of the back leg. Heel is down. Blade of the foot is down. This is beautiful. He just landed a double court. And then look at the execution of the technique. It's beautiful. Right? And now let's rewind a little bit. Let's rewind to the beginning of this trick combo. Okay? Right about here. And let's go back down to about 2.25 speed. And let's check this out. Okay? So he sets it up. Chop punch. Good extension. Hook kick. Massive. Okay? I'm going to start with the hook kick. Boys and girls, if you're tricking and your hook kick is not at head level and beautifully extended like that and goes from 45 to 45 like a good hook kick should... You need to fix your spin hook kicks, right? I see so many trickers nowadays that just throw like, and I'm not talking about trickers and tricking circles. I'm talking about like in sport karate competition that they're setting up their tricking pass and they do this like little little baby hook kick, right? And it's like, no, if you're going to do a hook kick, do a hook kick. Anise Sherpa did it. You can do it too, right? And now let's watch this. The rest of this in slow-mo. Beautiful raise. Carries the momentum right through. Look at this. One, two, Massive double cork, lands it perfectly, spins right out of it, chop punch, hits the beautiful stance. Big props to Anise Scherfer for being able to pull that off. Level of difficulty out of this world. We're going to watch the rest of this and enjoy it at normal speed. And again, full extension on the hands, right? And for him to be such a long competitor and be extending his hand techniques like that, that's impressive. A lot of really long, tall competitors have a tendency to underextend because it takes longer to get to the target. Huge pop front kick there. That pop front kick was probably like basketball hoop level, if not higher. I love the multiple punches there at the end, the energy. He knows that he just hit a gnarly form, and that's exactly what he did. So he can celebrate as much as he wants to. Uh, Anise Sherpa, that's awesome. And I don't think Anise has been on the podcast before in a film study, uh, so definitely wanted to give him that little highlight. Let's see what we're moving on to next. I actually don't know what the next video is. We're just watching Eminem's dancing here. While we're waiting on the next video, I can check and see if you guys have dropped any questions down there. <laughs> Michael Brumet says, the bravest man in all of sport karate, probably talking about Josh Durbin. And then Michael Mobb, sweet scissor kick. Oh, yeah, I mean, John Valera's scissor kick was out of this world. Chrissy Boyer showing love to Anise Sherpa stance. Oh, I know what this is. So this is the master challenge. Battle of Atlanta is known. I'm going to rewind this because we got to capture that moment again of Jeff Doss at the beginning. But the Battle of Atlanta is known for doing kind of unique, special things in their nighttime show, right? And one year, as a memorial to Junri, they had this cool looking Junri trophy. They did a master's challenge. Uh, and I forget all the details of the way that this competition worked, but it was basically a, a bracket style format. And I'm gonna go ahead and pause it because once again, I didn't get a chance to comment the intro of Jeff Doss. Uh, because I definitely want to commentate on that. So I'm going to pause it here so that we can take a look at the water bottle slam. Uh, but basically, they had a panel of judges. I think Nate Andre was on the panel, Marcel Jones. Uh, there were a lot of sport karate legends that were sitting on the panel judging this, and they were judging by certain criteria. So actually, if you look at the right side of the screen here and you see the, this list of, of, of things, I believe that there were individual scores given for power, posture, quickness, timing, flexibility, balance, and endurance. And then based on those individual scores that were given, those were all put together by a computer. And then that would ultimately tell you who won that round. And every round you had to do a different form, right? You had to do a different division. You had to do a different weapon. You had to switch it up in some way, shape, or form. And so a really unique way of doing it. They only did this for one year. I don't know why it didn't catch on. Uh, maybe it's just because they wanted to always be trying something new and different. But now we're going to take a look at Jeff Doss. Jeff Doss, who is going to be joining me 
in Battle Zone Countdown next weekend in the live show leading up to the show. He told me earlier this week that he expects to be in the show too. So he's going to come on a talk show before it, then go compete in the night show after it. Jeff, I hope you're able to pull that off, my man. But this is 2015. And look at this. This is vintage Jeff Doss. Slams the bottle of water into his head, getting himself pumped. There is nothing like a Jeff Doss intro. There is no one's intro that I enjoy watching more than watching a Jeff Doss intro. You see the style there? Jump switches his feet, turns around, says, give me my music. And then it looks like we're waiting on the music to start, or maybe it's playing. I hope this is intergalactic. Obviously, for the podcast, I don't play any music on it so that we don't get any copyright stuff or anything like that. Uh, okay, yeah, the music's not playing yet. That's what the look to the side was. Uh, but hopefully this is one of his intergalactic forms because that was always my favorites. And it looks like he is making sure that the DJ knows what's going on. <laughs> I didn't watch this video before I put it on the playlist because I remembered the form. And so when I saw it, I just threw it on here because I, I knew that it was entertaining. Uh, but I, I did not remember this little music mishap at the beginning. Looks like we're good to go now. Maybe All right, I'm going to have to fast forward here so we don't have to watch Jeff just walk around for three minutes. Uh, there we go. See, somebody's to the rescue. I can't tell who that is, uh, but somebody's to the rescue helping Jeff figure out the music. We're a minute and a half into this video and all we've seen is music malfunctions. All right, here we go. Jeff Dawes, everybody. So he's getting himself back in the zone, gives a big key eye. Uh, and that's really important to do as a competitor because mistakes happen technologically. There's going to be times that your music won't play. I love the way that Jeff kind of bounced around a little bit, yelled, got himself back in the moment, kind of got away from the distraction of the music, and now he's in the zone ready to go. And, oh, my goodness, did they mess up the music? Nope, they didn't mess up the music again. We're good. And based on that intro, it does look like we're getting intergalactic here, which means we get the eye gouge. And we're about to get the hand puppets. There it is. He's going to have the hand puppets talk to each other. This is like one of the most spontaneous and awesome things. He said old school before he did it. Then he does the little talking hand puppets. I love it. I love everything about it. Beautiful sidekick. Now, Jeff Doss, he's not only known for his intros. One of the great kickers all time in sport karate. The beauty of that sidekick. The flexibility to hold that leg up before throwing the axe kick. The multi-kick combinations. Jeff Dawes, a disciple of John Valera, who we saw earlier in this. Shows a little bit of style there. Split kick into the American splits. You love to see it. Give us a people's elbow at the end, Jeff. Is he going to do it? Yeah, people's elbow. Here it comes. Drops down. Huge people's elbow. That There's very few people that have ever been as entertaining as Jeff Dawes is. Sushi. You love to see it. Um, that was awesome. I love it. I love everything about it. We, we, we had some suspense at the beginning. We had to get the music figured out. But ultimately, we got it. And now we get another commercial, y'all. We are we are full of promotion tonight on the Jax Rudolph podcast. And it's going to make me watch the whole thing. Arby's, Wagyu Steakhouse Burger. Check it out, y'all. Okay, so now we move on. And obviously, if I was going to show Jeff in the Master Challenge, I got to show the guy who won the Master's Challenge. Uh, and that was Reed Presley. So Master Challenge it was actually something that I wanted to do. But I was 17 at the time. Yeah, I was 17, and they were only letting people above the age of 18 do it. So I didn't get a chance to do it. But Reed, who's a couple of years older than me, he was able to do it and go represent for our generation of weapons competitors. And so Reed went out there. This is in his American days. This is before he got picked up by Paul Mitchell. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted to show this, in addition to the fact that Reed wound up winning it, when I was watching this in preparation for the show, because obviously I like to make sure that there's no stumbles or anything like that because I don't want to, you know, show any lowlights of anybody. But I watched this form. This this is one of my favorite forms that I think I've seen Reed do. And I competed against him a lot. I've seen this form a bunch of times. This was a really good double bow form of his. And that's another reason why I wanted to highlight it. Obviously going to show a lot of love to Reed. He's going to be the best man at my wedding coming up in a couple of weeks. So shout out to you, my man. Uh, always was a pleasure sharing the ring with you. And uh, pleasure to commentate this form right now. So we're going to check it out. Puts the bows together. Does the little single bow segment. And really, that was one thing that I think made double bow work for Reed, where it didn't work for some people that tried it before him as effectively, um, was the fact that he could strike with them. He put the bows together and executed strike combos. You see swing combos here. He found a way to do some level of effective striking with double bows. He had a signature move there, the twirly bird, twirling one bow on the other, high level of difficulty. Um, and Reed Preston, I mean, that's why he is considered the innovator of double bow, because he was the first guy who was able to really 
make it win. He was the first guy to ever really stick with it and win overall grand championships with it. Uh, so shout out to Reed Presley. And he is the one who claimed that really cool kind of June Reed trophy. I think they still got it in the karate school there in Lebanon, Tennessee. And then this is a super random video that I found that I already gave the list of who's in it. I'll go ahead and rewind so that we can read that list of who all's involved in this real quick. So we got Mike Gorelli, Daniel Sterling, Manny Brown, Anthony Atkins, Anthony DeMarco, Really cool kind of random assortment of like early 2000s era competitors. Um, but really cool to just kind of watch this minute and a half of them tricking. There's Anthony DeMarco holding that handstand split thing. And you got guys jumping through the splits. You got Mike Gorelli going into his first trick. Some type of crazy side flip over the top thing to a split. Daniel Sterling, huge illusion twist. That was beautiful. Manny Brown, beach twist into the gainer. Again, this is the year 2000, y'all. This is the turn of the century. This stuff, these are innovators right here. Huge from Anthony Atkins. And then we get another Anthony, Anthony DeMarco. That's a crazy amount of contortion on that. Kind of an L kick there. Huge flash kick from Mike Gorelli. Daniel Sterling, he's also going to go for a corner pass. Oh, popping into another whip right after it. That's crazy. And then Manny Brown, very nice. Kind of a full step out there. Anthony Atkins back with the kicks. Huge split right into the Webster. That was cool. I want to see somebody do that in a form. I don't think I've ever seen that in a form. That big split and then landing on one foot going right into the Webster. That was kind of crazy. Mike Gorelli at it again. Whoa, again, I'm not really even sure what that was. This is crazy. <laughs> All right, what do we got here? A little kicking combination right into Anthony Atkins back at it again. Huge air. That's just massive. Anthony DeMarco donning a jacket now, showing off some breakdancing skills. Look at the pointed toes. Look at the leg extension. That's a Wushu competitor right there doing breakdancing. That is awesome. The speed of that, that's beautiful. Not necessarily martial arts, but, I mean, hey, it was cool, right? And then Manny Brown winds up winning the whole thing. So, yeah, just kind of a cool, pretty vintage video from the year 2000 there. And we get another ad, guys. We are rolling with the ads today. We're going to skip these ads. And now we're going to move on to some point fighting. You know, I love point fighting. Battle of Atlanta has always been known as a huge tournament for point fighting. And uh, these are two of the greatest fighters of the 2000s. Raymond Daniels, Ross Levine, watching their matches against each other. Uh, I was always a huge fan of them, both of them. Being at ringside watching them fight was super special. Real deal versus turbo. And then this was the Extreme Warrior Challenge Finals. So this was another one of those kind of unique events that Battle of Atlanta did. Again, I don't remember all of the rules here based on the way that Terry Creamer is officiating here. I believe it was that uh, both opponents could score on a clash and you scored on specific techniques. Again, I don't remember all the details, but it's essentially still just a point fight. Um, and so we're going to enjoy these two point fights. All right. So Ross takes off blitzing ahead. Ray looks like he thinks that he scored on the counter. Looks like Terry Creamer is giving it to Ross on the blitz. I, I thought that Ray's, uh, Ray's celebration there was a little bit much for as effective as that blitz of Ross was. Ross definitely scored there. And then we say we're going back into it. Good. Ross goes for the D side there. Couldn't tell if he was able to get it in. Ray clipped him with that right hand at the end. Didn't daze him, but he did clip him on the chin with that right hand at the end. And they're calling it in favor of Ray. Kind of a bad camera angle for us to see what happened on that particular clash. But Ray gets the score. And then again, just watching two fighters so cerebral, analyzing each other, feeling each other out. They know each other so well. This was not the first time they met. Ross does a good job of getting out of the way of a, of a big swing there at the end of that clash from Ray. Ross able to get the point. Ray coming up using the leg. Ross... Trying to get a flurry over the top. Are they going to call anything? Yeah, they call it in favor of Ross. Oh, so see, like there, Ross got two points for, I guess, two different techniques that he threw. So I think that was one of the cool parts of the rule set for these fighting matches was that if you did a combination of techniques, like a back fist reverse punch, you could score for the back fist and you could also score for the reverse punch. And then Ray on the attack there. Looks like that first body punch he threw got in. And they do call it. I assume that's what they're saying scored. He also followed up a few times, but it looked like Ross may have gotten out of the way. That first body punch landed, though. Then they get back into it. Beautiful takeoff from Ray. Ray celebrating. It, it, it didn't knock Ross out. He just tripped and fell a little bit. But Ray celebrating as if it was more of a knockout. That's okay. 
But that's one of the ways that, that Ray was smart as a fighter is that he would get the momentum in his favor by when he would have those moments, he would celebrate and he would showboat and it would swing momentum in his favor, right? Like right there, right? This is a pretty even fight so far. And Ray coming out of a clash, sticking his tongue out, playing to the crowd. Um, he's helping himself build up some momentum in this match. Ross tries to stick the D side there. looks like I might've slipped off, maybe even caught Ray on the glove. Ray throws the big round kick. Did that get in there? Oh, they're calling roster. I got to see that clash again in slow motion. I got to see that clash again in slow motion. Let's check this out again. So you see, and there's the round kick coming. So let's rewind just a little bit more. We're at 309. We'll go back to 304. And then now let's go ahead and turn this playback speed back. And this is one thing I, I've been talking a lot recently about how I think that at some point, point fighting needs to get, we can see that that kick did not score there. At some point, it'd be cool if point fighting had slow motion replay for the streams that we do at events. I know that's a very advanced broadcasting capability, but I do think it'd be cool. Okay, so Ross throws that front hand there. Ross takes off here. Ray throws the left misses, throws the right misses. There's the round kick that connects to the head of Ross. That round kick connected. And so let's see what the call is here, because I didn't see. Maybe there was something hidden. Maybe Ross landed something right before that kick came in that we just couldn't see at this angle. But I'm interested to see how they called this. And that's one of the things that's interesting about slow motion is that when you look back at it slow motion, it's very easy to see exactly what all went down. Oh, so, the, okay. So I guess they were saying that Ross must have landed something that we didn't see there from this angle. And he landed it before Ray threw that round kick. And that's why Ray didn't get the score there. But on that same note, right? If you have replay, I don't just think it'd be a good capability for streaming. But I think that in the finals, you don't want to do this in divisions because then divisions take forever. But in the finals, in the night show, give the coach a challenge. It increases the role of the coach in a point fight, and it makes for really exciting moments in a point fight. Where if a coach sees a clash, and maybe it's a big momentum swinging clash, and a coach doesn't think that a fighter scored or thinks that his fighter did score, then that coach can say, hey, I'm going to throw my challenge flag. You go back and you look at the replay and you see who truly landed first. I think that would be really exciting. Again, only in the night shows. You can't do it in the eliminations because it would slow things down way too much because every coach would challenge something in every fight. But I do think it'd be interesting in the night shows. Um, and I think you do it like the NBA does it, where you get one challenge. doesn't matter if you win or lose. You got one challenge. You lose it. It's gone. I think that's a good way to do it. Ray takes off on the blitz. Looks like he caught Ross flat-footed there for a second. He's able to score with it. And again, the adjustments over the course of this long fight from both fighters, right? We saw Ross taking a lead early. We saw Ray making the adjustments. Now we're going to see Ross trying to make some adjustments. Ross, he backs up there off the line, tries to land a counter on Ray as Ray comes on the attack. Ross knew Ray was coming. Ray that time a little bit faster, able to score. And then now Terry Kramer seeing it. There's a call for the uh, the counter striking of Ross. And it looks like he might have gotten it on the counter strike. And let's see, how close are we to the end here? What's going on? Yeah, we still got three minutes left in this fight. There's some type of judging discrepancy going on here. While they're getting this figured out, let me take another little peek at the comment section. Absolutely. <laughs> Jeff Doss telling us to fast forward. Jeff Doss says Mike Welch, it was the guy uh, who uh, who was the assist there. All right, so Jeff, thank you for tuning in, my man. And uh, now let's pay attention to this fight. Looks like they got whatever judging situation they had to get figured out. Huge clash there. Big strikes being exchanged. Ross thought he landed first, and they don't call anything. Okay. And so here comes Ross again, working the leg. Again, as Ray is coming away from us and Ross is coming at us, we can't really see what lands first there, so kind of hard to tell from this angle. And it looks like we're going to get interrupted by an ad here in a moment. So thank you once again, you two. And Paramount Plus, we had Disney Plus earlier in the show. Now we got Paramount Plus. We don't, we don't discriminate between our streaming services here. We love SpongeBob. All right, here we go. So Ray takes off, misses on the back fist, gives Ross an opportunity to capitalize on the counter strike. It looks like he will. Oh, I don't think that Ross scored there. Yeah, I don't think. Okay, so yeah, Ross didn't score there. And Ross is checking, being like, oh, wait a minute. I, I think I might should have scored there. He's making him double check the flags. Certainly looked to me like Ross scored there. And Ray probably did too. If they're calling things both ways, if that's how the rules of this fight worked, it looked like Ray might have gotten a point or two in there as well. Ross, D side, that's trademark. Actually, it was a little bit more of a step up side than it was a D side. He kind of moved forward into that. 
It was one point body kicks here. So that's an interesting uh, point of debate for everybody to talk about in the comments. That's always hotly debated. Again, these guys are swinging because that's the thing. Like these guys were rivals for all of the 2000s. And so when they have an opportunity like this in, in a format like this, where the judges are going to let them swing on each other a little bit, they're going to throw, they're going to throw some hard punches. They're going to try to demoralize the other guy. And that's one thing you love about both of these fighters. Again, I love both of these fighters um, because their skill level, their fight IQ, their talent, it, it's just insane. Ray's still showboating, even though Terry Creamer is calling something in Ross's favor. And Ross did not get the point, and Ray did not get the point. They call nothing. And now there's some other kind of stoppage, and Ray is frustrated by it. Ross is scratching his head. And let's fast forward a little bit here. What's going on? Right, well, there's not enough time left to fast forward. Might be a scorekeeping issue. I'm trying to figure out what's happening. Okay, yeah, so this looks like it's going to be the final moment of the fight. Ross on the attack with the hands. Ray throws the D side. Looks like this is going to determine the fight. That might have been overtime. And Ray is frustrated with what happened. I'm trying to tell what happened here. Okay, so now Ray is celebrating. So Ray did get the point. Let's watch that last clash. Let's watch that last clash a little bit more slowly and try to see what happens here. Is this before that clash happens? Or is this after? Yeah, we need to rewind a little bit more, it looks like. Yeah, we need to rewind a little bit more. Let's watch this last clash one more time and see what should have happened. Okay, so Ray is doing... Okay, so it looks like this was the transition to overtime. It looks like this is going to be sudden death. And now let's go in slow motion. And here's a great example where let's see. Let's watch this clash in slow motion. And let's see if Ray should have scored on this exchange or if it should have been Ross. I have no idea. I've never watched this in slow motion. This is my first time watching it in slow motion. But let's just see. So they're going into it. Ross attacks. Ray throws the D side. Let's watch it one more time. It looked like the D side got in before Ross was able to connect with his hands. But the reason I want to watch this again is you also got to look at the extension. I'm a big believer in that a kick's got to be extended and have stopping power. So Ross definitely did not land. Ross's hands came up short. Ray's kick did make contact. It wasn't 100% fully extended, but I do think that's a sidekick that you got to score because the sidekick got in and hit Ross in the ribs firm. And so I think that's fair, right? So this is a great example of a close call. You watch that at full speed. You're like, hey, maybe Ross's hand did get there. You watch it at full speed. You're like, hey, maybe, maybe Ray's foot didn't, maybe his leg didn't fully extend like you want it to. Um, but you go back and you watch a slow motion and you're like, yeah, race foot got in there. He stuck a hard kick. He didn't fully extend the knee, but it doesn't need to be fully extended. It just needs to be an effective sidekick, right? My pet peeve is when people lift their foot up and it is a chamber. They haven't even kicked at all yet. And then somebody's throwing a blitz and they run into the foot and then that's two points in NASCAR for the other. Yeah, I, I could get on my soapbox about that, but I won't get on my soapbox about it. Either way, looks like that fight had the outcome that it was supposed to or that it should have because of the way that that last clash was scored. But a great fight between two all-time great point fighters. Ross Levine recently inducted into the Black Belt Magazine Hall of Fame in this year's class as competitor of the year for what he's done as a sport karate competitor over his career, as well as uh, his big win in karate combat that happened last year. He got another big win this year. Uh, and now he's going to be going up to the middleweight title bout in karate combat. So Ross Levine, wishing you the best of luck there, my man. And as far as Raymond Daniels goes, also looking forward to uh, whatever MMA news comes out of him next. And so now we're going to show off a little bit more point fighting. We showed a Ross Levine clip, which got me thinking of Team Impex. And then I thought back to this 2015 point fighting final between Team Paul Mitchell and Impex. And if you know that I'm showing Paul Mitchell on the show, you know Paul Mitchell's going to be getting the win, right? So we're going to watch this three-man team fight. Now, this one I did not watch pre-show. This one I literally just saw it and was like, oh, yeah, I remember watching this fight. And so we're going to play it here. So it looks like we got Laszlo and Paul Mitchell in the black. And is that Willie? I think that's Willie Hicks for Impex. Laszlo showing off the round kick there. Laszlo's speed was just so impressive. And then look at Laszlo's footwork. One thing that I think set Laszlo apart from other fighters and what allowed his speed to be so effective is that look at his bounce. His bounce is unusual. He doesn't bounce like a normal point fighter. He does at times, but he also like does this weird, almost like a one foot at a time bounce that I really do think allows him to kind of throw off the other fighter. Willie takes off there. Laszlo counters. Looks like I thought Willie scored there, but they don't call it his way. 
Bull Fighter's working a couple of fakes. Laszlo's coming. Oh, Laszlo backs off, throws the defensive sidekick right into the gut of Willie. He gets two. Now, this is normal NASCA rules team fighting, so body kicks are two points here. Laszlo tries to throw the defensive kick again. That time, Willie's able to jam it, get on the inside. Oh, what do they call it? Yeah, they don't call anything. That's a good That's a good no call. If anything, you'd call Will, uh, Willie's way there because of the way he got inside. I couldn't tell if he landed or not. Willie takes off. Good defense from Willie. Changes his uh, approach quickly. Then Laszlo able to get a, a kick up. Didn't score. And now Willie's got a glove issue. All right, here we go again. And there was, again, notice that kind of like creeping bounce that, that, that Laszlo had there. It's just, it's just different. It's just different. It's so subtle, but it was different. Now we got the second round. I believe that's Justin Ortiz in the traditional uh, black uniform that the Forms and Weapons competitors wear. And Justin Ortiz showing off his signature hot foot here early in the fight. Going up against Jason Grenier in the blue for Impex. Grenier takes off on the attack. Looks like he landed with the back fist. Oh, they don't call the back fist. Okay. All right. I saw the back fist. I'll give Impex some love. So here's J.O. working that leg. Around this time, you can make an argument J.O. was the best lightweight in the world. The speed that he had, the way that he could use that leg, there's a reason they called him Hot Foot. So entertaining to watch, so talented, such a smart fighter. Uh, I could say all kinds of great things about J.O. I can say a lot of great things about Jason Grenier as well. Jason Grenier is a fighter that gets overlooked too often when you're talking about kind of those 2000s to 2010 era fighters. Jason Grenier had a lot of good fights in Made a couple of Warrior Cup finals from what I remember. J.O. working that leg so effectively as he always does. His balance is crazy. I believe based on the last round, Paul Mitchell's got a little bit of a lead here. Oh, it looks like Paul Mitchell's up three to nothing right now based on the scoreboard in the background. No calls there. Looks like J.O.'s got a little equipment malfunction. They're going to get that taken care of. Once again, giving a shout out to Black and Blue Video for providing us this footage. Oh, see, look, here's the slow-mo replay. And look at that. It shows the kick sliding in right into the ribs. That's two points. See, this, this video from 2015 proving my point. See how much better things are with slow-mo? It made that kick look so much better. And then I couldn't really tell what happened there. J.O. was frustrated about something. Just tell me I don't know what happened. But anyway. All right, now we've got the final round. We've got Zolt Marotti in the black. And we've got, is that Avery? Is that a young Avery? It's got to be a young Avery, right? All right, so here comes Zolt working his legs. Zolt, one of the all-time great kickers. Arguably the greatest European point fighter in history. Was the first uh, European fighter to come over to America and win a diamond ring. I believe that would have been 2013 he won that diamond ring. Going off of memory alone there, so correct me if I'm wrong. All right, so we're going to watch these two guys go to work. Zolt takes off using his hands, able to score there. And then Zolt working the leg. Good defense there. Getting the hand up in time, deflecting the kick. Nice takeoff there. <laughs> I don't want to misquote. I'm pretty sure that's young Avery. I know that I'm going to sound silly if I'm wrong, or I sound silly if it's definitely Avery. I'm just, yeah, that's Avery. That's definitely Avery. Anyway. I don't know who else it would be, to be honest with you, from Impex at that time. Yeah. So anyway, there's something happened. There's some other scoring debate. Anyway, <laughs> Ronnie Presley jumping in the comments saying, let's see Kiss. I love it. We, we are not going to be showing the Kiss demo today. That is a, uh, yeah. You, you had to be there in person to see that footage. There was myself and Reed and Cole Presley, Jake Presley, we, we did a, a KISS opening demo one year at the Battle of Atlanta where I was uh, basically shirtless with like a, a white blue jean jacket uh, doing a bow demo. That was, uh, that was peak Jackson Rudolph right there, I reckon. But anyway, and so we see, so this fight actually got close in the late goings and that was as time expired. Wait, things got exciting while I was looking at the comments here. Let's rewind a little bit and see how this last class goes. Last class, excuse me. So we see Zolt working the leg there. It's clutch time. Zolt takes off on the blitz. He scores with the blitz. And then Zolt backing up a little bit. And time's going to expire right there. Yeah, time expires. And it was that blitz from Zolt 
gives Paul Mitchell the edge that they need. It looks like final score was six to four. So Paul Mitchell was up one. Impex had a chance to come back and try to force overtime or take the lead with a kick. But Zolt is able to get that extra cushion with the blitz using his hands. J.O.'s happy. He's celebrating. And Team Paul Mitchell takes home that team fighting title. Uh, two of the great teams of this time era between Team Impex and Team Paul Mitchell. Much respect to everybody involved in that. That was a lot of fun to watch. And now we have the final video of this film study. So if you guys have any questions for me, make sure you drop them down in the comments now because I'm going to take a look at that before we finish up tonight. And this was the one video of me that I wanted to show tonight because I think there's some good lessons to be learned here. And as far as my career path goes, this was a pretty historically significant form because this was the last form that I would ever run in a team change the game uniform. This was Battle of Atlanta of 2012 at the U.S. Open, the very next tournament, I would be added to Team Paul Mitchell the Friday of the U.S. Open. So without even knowing it, this was the last form that I ever did in a change the game uniform, which is kind of crazy. Um, so we're going to take a look here. Now, I don't consider this to be my prime. Yes, I was winning, and obviously I was good enough to get on Paul Mitchell, and, and I had won major titles. Um, but there, there are a couple of things that I'll point out here that I improved on as I became an older competitor up in the 16, 17 division and in the adult division. When people ask me, I say that my, my best years were right there last year as a junior. And then those, those years as an adult is when I, I truly feel like I was at the top of my game. But this was important for me because this is when everybody realized that I had the chance to be that this, this was me kind of becoming that guy right um, and I also really enjoyed this form uh, because I was playing Devin went down to Georgia at the Battle of Atlanta so the crowd was getting into it uh, Devin pulled the ball across the strings he rosined up his bow right so I like the choreography here and then see there's little things right so little things that I'm talking about you guys are probably looking at this like Jackson you look fine you're being too hard on yourself right but again one of the reasons that I wanted to show this is that I want to show how important it is to make sure that you're studying yourself, right? So this is 2012, this is 10 years ago, right? That right side strike. I wasn't happy with that right side strike. I didn't extend it, right? So see like right there in that opening strike combo, you look at it full speed and you're like, yeah, that was fine, that was wrong, right? But then I look at that and then I go back and I look at it slow-mo and I'm like, I know it was just one little strike, but I needed that right side strike finished, right? So that's one thing that I wanna encourage young players to do. Go back, watch your videos slow and hold yourself accountable. I was happy with my speed here, it was a difficult release combination, especially for it to be 2012. That release combo was ahead of its time. I was much happier with that strike combo. Felt much better about my extension there. A little peacock, which is that spin behind the back. Hand roll. And then again, another strike combo going into a little signature move there. I call it the Lauren Casey because Lauren Carney and Casey Marks always did that in their forms. This little wraparound move. There's that fantail raise up that I learned from Nate Andre. Double spin, bam. And then this was the first season that I started doing the 900. And this is why I'm showing this video. I'm showing this video because I dropped. And weirdly, over the course of the past couple of weeks when I've been teaching my private lessons, I've had a lot of students that are like, Jackson, did you just never drop? Like, like how did you never drop? And I'm like, what are you talking? Like, no, I definitely dropped. It happened. It happens to everybody. I tried to avoid it as often as possible through work ethic, through the amount of reps that I was doing, through mindset, through the way that I approached competition, through the strategy that I used in competition to try to do the form that had the highest percent chance of success, both in terms of finishing the form and getting the win. Those are all things that contributed to me having a reputation as a consistent competitor. That doesn't mean I was perfect. Things like this happen, right? It happens to everybody. And the reason that I wanted to show this video is because I did like the form all the way up until that drop. But I also wanted to analyze a little bit of what happens. Because if you notice on this technique, and I'll give a little bit of context here. So up until the 2012 season, nobody had spun twice and caught the bow behind their back in competition. This was the, the big move that I was doing at the end of my form to help me win overalls in 2012. I was winning in 2011. I needed to step up my game in 2012. 2012 was my first year in the 14-17 division. We saw Austin Crane earlier in this show, and Austin Crane was the top weapons guy when I moved up into 14-17 that year. And so I was literally training to beat Austin. And Austin had 
crazy levels of difficulty. He could do the Webster pivot, throw his commas, do another Webster land. He had the crazy comment manipulations. And so I needed to do something that people hadn't done before to prove that I could still be the guy, that I could still be the guy who wins the most overall grand championships. And so the 900 was one way that I did that. 900 meaning two and a half spins. And so as we take a look at this, let me make sure that I put it in slow motion. So high risk, high reward, right? And this is an example of it being high risk. So I set it up here. And the lesson to be learned here is that I'm completely happy with everything about this setup. My spins are good. I spot the bow in between. And then look at what happens. I just closed my hand too early. The bow simply has not gotten down to my hand yet. And I just closed my hand too soon. I've got my eyes over the shoulder on the bow. So let's rewind this one more time. And we're going to fast forward a little bit here. Okay, check this out. So I come around, going for the behind the back pass. Right leg's in front just like I want. Push off the thumb just like I want. I spot the bow in between the two spins. And then right there is where something just happens. So I'm going to pause it here at a very specific moment. Right there. So look at this. This is the position that I want to be in, right? I've got my, let's see, it's my right hip coming up closer to the judges. This is my preferred catch position. Posture's pretty good. I'm a little bit more hunched here than I would like to be, but that's not the reason I dropped. I've got my eyes over my shoulder looking at the bow. I know where the bow is. There's no reason that this mistake should have been made. I just closed my hand too soon. I closed my hand too soon. The bow gets deflected off of it. I try to make a, a futile effort at a last second save attempt, but obviously that was in vain. I miss it and it just happens, right? I clap my hands a few times. I smile. I step back as, oh, excuse me, guys. My video just got paused because my fiance was trying to FaceTime me. Uh, so here we go. And then I throw in a triple spin just for the crowd. So lesson to be learned there, right? Here's the reason that I showed this clip. Number one, not every drop is because something terrible happened or you made some mistake. There, I just broke it down step by step. Every little part of the 900, I did exactly the way that I wanted to do it. I just closed my hand too early. I closed my hand before the bow was there. Everything else was how I wanted it. So sometimes you can do everything that you want to do and it just doesn't go your way and that's okay. Secondly, the fact that I understand that and the fact that I learned that through moments like this is why I'm able to clap, look at the facial expression, I'm disappointed, but I'm smiling, right? And then I did a triple for the crowd, right? So understanding that a drop in a moment is not the end of the world. I've seen way too many competitors today on the circuit right now that have had a drop and they come off stage crying or something like that. And I get it. I get it if you're 13 and under. Kids cry when they drop. I get that. And I get it that it's okay to be emotional when you fail, when you come up short. But if it's the Battle of Atlanta and you desperately want to win the Battle of Atlanta, the Battle of Atlanta is coming next year. It's going to be okay. You're going to have another chance. I competed in probably eight other Battle of Atlantas after this, probably nine other Battles of Atlanta after this, right? So you're going to have other opportunities. Let's say it's not just about one tournament, even better. There's another tournament a month from now. Go win that instead. So don't beat yourself up too much over individual failures and individual moments. And number three is that anytime you step on that stage, it is your responsibility to act as a role model and to entertain. Number one, acting as a role model. You don't want a kid to see you get all upset about a drop or get angry or whatever, right? That's, that's a small point. The bigger point is we want to grow this sport. And I go ahead and stop screen sharing now. But the bigger point is, is that we want to grow this sport into a spectator sport. We want this to be a sport that people tune in and turn on their television to watch. And if you are going to do that, the show must go on, right? And so the reason that I would do things like that, even after dropping a 900 and my chances of the overall grand championship going away, I still picked my bow back up, put a smile on my face, even though I was disappointed, and then I did a triple. I did the triple, I landed the triple, and then finished the form from there, right? And the crowd reacted nicely to the triple. 
because they appreciated that even though I made a mistake, even though I had failed, I still put on a show. And at the end of the day, a couple of weeks later, Paul Mitchell still gave me the phone call and put me on the team. So that drop, that failure did not change my destiny. It didn't change everything that I've been working for, right? So the reason I show that video is not to show you, hey, look at this form that I did. No, it was 10 years ago and I already pointed out there were things that I wish I could have done better in that form 10 years ago, right? So it's not to do that, but it's to show you the things that you can learn from that form, the things that I learned as a competitor from having that experience and having that moment. That's the reason that I wanted to share that form. So now I'm gonna take, uh, <laughs> Jeannie Jones, I'm taking a look at the comments. I promised I'd take a look at the comments before we got off the show tonight. Jeannie Jones says, so you dropped in 2012 once. Uh, I, I tried to keep it that way. Don't get me wrong. I, I certainly tried to keep my, my drop rate as low as possible. My dad actually, so this is a cool little bit of information to, to kind of wrap this show up with. If you ask my dad, my dad kept a spreadsheet of the results of every division, every runoff, every overall grand for the entirety of my career from like 2007 all the way through the last time that I've competed up until this point. I might come back again, who knows. Uh, but 2021 US Open, my dad has a spreadsheet of all of it, right? And on that spreadsheet, he can actually run the numbers on what my drop percentage was and, and stuff like that, what my win percentage was, my career numbers, uh, which is something that I feel like every competitor should have because it's really cool to look back on it and see what you've been able to achieve. Um, and I, I don't want to quote it because I don't remember exactly what the number was, but I want to say that my career catch percentage across every forum that I ever did was something like 91%, um, which I'm proud of that. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's awesome, right? Um, you know, it's cool to look back and see that type of thing. So yes, if you see my dad at Battle of Atlanta, you can ask him. He does have a spreadsheet that has all of my results and drop catch, whatever on it. And for any karate parents tuning in and watching this, start doing that for your competitors. Start doing that for your kids because one day they'll be 24 years old and maybe they'll be a medical student. Maybe they'll be hosting a podcast and they'll want to know like, hey, how many times did I win that thing? How often did I catch my bow? How many times did I drop? And, and it's, it's interesting. And also from a historical sport karate perspective, if we had those types of numbers for everybody, it'd be really cool to post those things on social media. Like you see, you know, people posting Wilt Chamberlain stat lines for NBA basketball, right? So I do think that that's an important historical aspect of our sport that is missing is that we don't keep any kinds of statistics. And I do think we should start keeping up with statistics more as a whole. And that's not something we can expect every single parent to do, but that's something that we can do on the tournament level, on the circuit level, on the scorekeeping software level. There's a couple of different levels that we could try to keep up with some more stats at. And if anybody has ideas on that, I'd love to hear them because that's something that I think would be really cool. But without further ado, this has been a long show tonight. So thank you guys for sticking with me. When I set up this film study, I didn't think it was going to take that long, but we've been here for almost an hour and a half. Appreciate you guys' support. Remember, for the next three weeks, no normal episodes of the Jax Rudolph podcast, but at the Battle of Atlanta, three live television-style episodes of the podcast. We're going to have a ton of fun. Don't forget to tune in. Stay tuned to Black Belt Magazine social media, as well as my own social media for more updates about those streams, as well as guest announcements. Thank you to Black Belt Magazine. I'm wrapping it right here for sponsoring the Jax Rudolph podcast. And thank you to all of our lovely viewers for tuning in. We couldn't do it without you. I'm your host, Jackson Rudolph, and I'll see you next time.